Welcome. I'm going to talk about packaging Rust for Debian. And just to start off, how many have written a Hello World or similar in Rust? All right. And how many have used a Debian derivative or Debian? All right, so you will know what I'm talking about. That's good. So I will start with some introduction. I will talk about a little bit about philosophical questions that impact the packaging effort. We will go through some practical information about how it works. And then we will go through more information about how it works. And I will finish up with uh, highlighting some problems or like areas of concern where the Rust view on reality doesn't match Debian's view on reality. I found myself with a lot of free time in 2020, so I decided to uh, help out in the packaging effort of Rust uh, software for Debian. And by now I maintain roughly a hundred packages in Debian and most of those are libraries and two of those are binaries. In my day job I'm a security engineer um, and being a security engineer naturally it made me more interested in Rust also. So the elevator pitch for Rust is maybe maybe not needed, but really Rust is a high level language, I would say, that lets you write efficient code without the insecurities that uh, C and C++ exposes you to. You are suddenly, or now, able to not choose between good security and efficient, and can choose both at once. And, oh yeah, this I already said, so, uh, so Rust has become popular and well, it's becoming more popular, I would say. Like, if we look at crates.io, we see that there is a lot of crates that implement command line utilities or development tooling and similar things. And it being distributed on crates.io is, of course, nice, but it's not nice enough, I would say. Being able to consume these projects by, by just installing them through your regular uh, package manager is, well, a step above in user experience. And Debian, packaging for Debian is a good place to have high impact on your uh, working time. By packaging for Debian, it also gets packaged into all Debian derivatives like Ubuntu, Kali Linux, and so on. So I started to package for Debian due to the impact factor, basically. And Debian makes a certain number of promises to its users. And these promises have a lot of impact on the packaging work. So the first and most obvious promise is that software in Debian is free. And Debian takes this seriously and they actually audit that it's free and have processes in place to ensure it. So there is a copyright review when a package enters Debian. There is a license review. And, well, we try to make sure that we only package source code. 
This is, of course, not always true, as I will highlight later on, but in general, this holds. And in Debian, there is a team called FTP Masters, uh, and that's where a lot of these uh, auditing happen. Another thing that impacts the packaging effort is that uh, Debian promises its users that it can be rebuilt without internet access. This is often referred to as an uh, uh, island test in Debian, like without, or if you are on an island without internet access, this should do, still work to build uh, Debian. This has a number of implications. Like every dependency needs to be packaged, and we can't download anything from crates.io or npm or anywhere else. This also needs, means that the compiler tool chain gets complicated. Uh, Cargo, the, uh, oh, what do you call it, the helper for the compiler, is a Rust project that is built from a lot of community uh, Rust crates. This, these things can of course not be built without having a Rust compiler in place first. And, well, you can imagine there is a, a, a loop here. You need cargo in order to build the crates that cargo consists of. And uh, that's why it gets tricky. So, typically the solution here is duplication and having a minimal, uh, minimal Rust compiler to bootstrap. Another principle is that Debian tries to uphold a level of quality of what we have packaged. By spending some time up front, we save a lot of security work later, and also by not packaging a band number, we don't take on a lot of maintenance work that we have to, well, uphold for the life of Debian, or at least a release. This means that we rewrite a lot of stuff, so there is a crate called Tempteer that provides a temporary directory with, that has been abandoned and we rewrite that one to temp file and so on for other abandoned packages. It also means that we try to write manual pages for binaries, provide uh, tag completion and, well, similar uh, things. All right, so let's look at how this uh, works in practice a bit more. One of the great things with Cargo is that it's built with offline support from the get-go. It's easy to configure Cargo to not access the internet and instead look for all dependencies in a local directory. This we do during the build phase of packages. And uh, Rust, all, all the Rust, all binaries built from Rust packages is statically built. Uh, we when we try to build a library in uh, uh, 
for distribution, we could build it into an rlib file. And that is a compiled uh, lib or uh, binary file with a source code of, or not the source code, but a compiled binary file of the library. This rlib file is compiler version specific and uh, that's why we don't use it. We, Rust doesn't have a stable ABI yet. It's, uh, well, work in progress uh, to stabilize that, but uh, since it hasn't been done yet, we don't use that yet. And instead, all libraries are packaged as source code uh, in Debian, and Rust uh, binaries are statically linked. The static link doesn't extend into the C uh, well, domain. So libraries, C libraries are not statically linked into the Rust binaries. Talking about C libraries, Rust and C is super easy to interface together. So it's very common that Rust libraries, uh, well, wraps a C library, and uh, those uh, wrapped libraries are, uh, well, used as dynamic uh, linked libraries. The pure Rust libraries, though, they, um, well, they get uh, or we, the dependency tree of uh, the libraries gets translated to the, a Debian uh, dependency tree on the, the Debian package level. And we let the Debian apt tool, or dpkj tool maybe, resolve that dependency when we build the package. So, typically what happens when we build a Rust binary is that it depends on a number of Rust libraries. Those, in the, they depend on them as build depends. And those get dropped into a directory on your local file system. And the compiler runs from that. A uh, Rust library or binary can also have what is called build dependencies. That is dependencies that is not uh, used in the actual binary, but only during the build phase. For example, unit test frameworks or uh, well, uh, manual page generation libraries or similar things. And um, um, ah, yeah. And uh, these dependencies. Oh, I realize I messed up a bit. But these dependencies are either included in the default features in uh, Rust or in optional features. But so the default feature is a feature set that is always present, uh, but can be disabled, and the optional features is the other way around. So optional features are not always present, but can be enabled. Dependencies that is part of the default uh, feature, we typically always must package in Debian uh, in order to not break the build. The optional features is the other way around. We really, they should really be packaged, but it can be uh, disabled. And if they are uh, used in tests, those tests must be disabled and so on. Having a working set of unit tests for a library is super nice, it saves a lot of time and errors down the line. So we try to have working unit tests 
for everything, but it's not always possible. So, unit tests. For uh, Rust credit that is packaged into Debian, unit tests are run in two places. It's a pre-installed phase where we run unit, the unit tests for the package of the default feature if it doesn't have any dev dependencies. And this is another case where we need to make some compromises in order to uh, avoid having loops in the dependency tree. Then there is something called the post-install phase. And here is where most unit tests are run. So, uh, uh, what happens is that the library is installed in the uh, directory and then built in the test binary. And a test binary is built and executed for, uh, well, the default feature set and then enabling all features at once. Uh, not enabling any features at all, and then enabling each feature individually. And Rust stipulates that features in crates should be additive, and far from all Rust crates use features in that way. It's super common to have an STD feature and a no STD feature. Uh, and std here refers to the standard Rust library. So no std features typically disable the standard library or don't use any features from that. And we, well, sometimes we run into uh, unit test failures and that is because Rust uh, packaging that we do is based on crates.io and not all projects upload all their uh, test fixtures to crates.io. For example, uh, image parsing libraries might have a large amount of uh, broken images in various states and those are not uploaded to crates.io due to crates.io having a 10 megabyte size limit. Um, there is also, or it is also very common to not feature guard uh, unit tests. So the developer of a library might only run the unit test for the default feature set while we in Debian run it uh, for a lot more feature sets. Or it might be more well, common porting pro problems, like we run uh, uh, testing on both big Debian and small Debian machines, and both 32 and 64 bit machines. And well, not all developers of open source software have access to that normally. Debian also, or Debian, Rust also have very nice uh, benchmarking setups. We don't use that. Uh, we typically don't have any tooling in place to monitor for uh, perf well, performance regressions, uh, so those get disabled. And Debian, as I said, is big on copyright and license, so this needs to be uh, handled manually. Alright, so our tooling for doing this. When you start uh, with uh, your packaging work, like saying I would like to package a binary into Debian, 
The first thing is to determine uh, what dependencies of this package is not in Debian yet. So that uh, because typically you need to make a tree out of your dependencies and start at the leaf nodes. And dev status is the tooling for doing that. So it typically looks like this. You run dev status uh, for a project. This is for the project bottom. And it identifies that clap version 3.22 is not packaged in Debian. Clap stands for command line argument parser. And uh, clap in, well, uh, have a dependency in itself, claplex, that is not packaged into Debian, and uh, you repeat this for the whole tree, and typically start at the leaf nodes and package inwards or upwards. And creating a Debian package is well, it's a complex operation, like Debian has been active for a long time and supports a lot of different things, basically. And the creation of the package from the Debian, or from the creates uh, metadata can be, well, largely, largely automated. Not all the things, but most of the things can be automated. So these are the tools for doing that automation. We have um, Deb Cargo Conf, that is maybe the most important part. That is a big monorepo of all the configuration for well, most uh, Rust packages in Debian. And in Deb Cargo Conf, there is some scripts that invoke Deb Cargo. Deb Cargo produces the actual Debian packages, and the Debian packages uh, use the DH Cargo uh, or, uh, script to actually build it. And DH Cargo stand, stands for Debian Helper uh, Cargo. And there is similar Debian helper scripts for other uh, programming languages. So let's look at how this might look. Can everyone see this? A bit larger. So we have a package script uh, in the Deb Cargo conf uh, and uh, we will package a crate called our toolbox. Our toolbox is a, well, it's maybe not a package I would uh, recommend people to use. It's some maintainer of some uh, tooling that made a small crate with his utility functions. And to be honest, they look a bit wonky, but that's kind of out of scope. So, uh, we package or run the package script for that. The package script downloads from credits.io and produces a number of files. So it produces a changelog file, a copyright file, and a copyright hint file and uh, places them into the monorepo. Uh, let's look at that. Oh, yeah. Uh, the changelog file is a standard Debian changelog. It's, oh, I have some UTF-8 problems. Disregard that. And this, you need to populate yourself uh, with some information about what you're doing. 
in, in order to communicate to other maintainers of Debian. Uh, same with the uh, same with the copyright file. It's uh, it contains best guesses of the copyright uh, situation of the package. So upstream contact, uh, what uh, years. Uh, the program has developed from what license it operates under and so on. And well, you need to do some detective work basically here. Once you have done that, you can actually build it. Um. All right. This is my backup computer due to HMI, so you have to live with some UTF-8 and uh, similar. Here it sets up the um, Shroot environment. So Shroot is a precursor to Docker, well, maybe and sort of. And then it will build the package inside the Shroot. And Step one here is to, what it's doing right now is to set up the fruit environment. A typical thing with building Rust packages is that you have to wait for the compiler. This is also true in packaging work. Like, I have no idea why this is so slow, but uh, here we are. All right. The demigods are graceful, it seems. We got further, but... Yeah. Maybe. I'm doing all my packaging work on a Debian machine. This laptop runs Ubuntu, but packaging um, is typically a lot easier if you package on the distribution that you are targeting. So I run this on a virtual machine running in Debian, and similar when I do Arch packaging work, I run it on an Arch uh, machine. All right, so the environment was set up and then it resolved the dependency, the Rust library dependency tree and identified some Rust libraries that needs to be installed. Typically, the, here we installed a, a crate for do, accessing Windows APIs and well, th this is a peculiar thing in the dependency resolution in Cargo. So, even if you're on an environment that doesn't, oh well, it's not Windows, Cargo still wants all source code to be present when it uh, runs its build. It will not read the source code, but if it's not present, then it's, uh, it breaks. So we package some Windows-specific APIs. Then it starts the actual build here and uh, runs uh, unit tests and so on. And, well, the build completed and we can... Oh, we can see that it failed. Demogods, as I said. Uh, and why did it fail? 
All right, it failed due to some network connectivity problem. We will not try to resolve that, but I think my Debian index is too old. All right, but we're not done yet. So once we have built uh, the software or the crate, it's you actually, or once you have built all dependencies, it's time to build the actual binary, and that is the same process, but a binary typically has some more demands. So we really want a manual page for all binaries in Debian, and if upstream provides a manual page, then everything is uh, fine and dandy, but if they don't, we have to produce this. Uh, typically we can tweak, or sometimes it's possible to uh, run the manual page generation as part of the build. If it's not possible, then there is some uh, hacks to get around it anyway, like help to man uh, is a project that takes a help page and tries to generate a manual page from that. But a lot of Rust crates use a library called clap, the command line argument parser, and clap have a plugin to generate manual pages. So I have written a number of pull requests upstream that look slightly like this. Uh, and here, the interesting part is this include thing. So what we do is to abstract away all uh, the clap configuration code into its own file called the source uh, CLI. And then we include that in both the build script, build.rs, and in the binary itself. And then in the build script, we use the clap configuration to generate a manual page from it. And that means that the manual page automatically stays in sync with what is actually in the binary. Mm. So this clap manian project, uh, really nice, I like it. Similar, there is a clap complete project that operates uh, or generates uh, tab completion files for uh, well a lot of different uh, shells. So uh, you can automatically generate your tab completion uh, files from the clap configuration. All right. So let's talk a bit about when stuff doesn't work. So I've touched upon this thing about loops uh, a number of times. So uh, being able to not having uh, any loops in your dependency tree is important, otherwise uh, if package A depend on package B, but package B depend on package A, it's impossible to install one of them before the other, and typically we can't install stuff simultaneously, so then we have a loop and that's a problem. And Debian uh, packages each crate as, uh, as a package and Rust uh, dependency loop resolution is not on the crate level, it's on the feature level. So this might be a problem. You could end up in a situation that looks something like this. You have two crates, A and B, and those have each two features. So feature AX depends on feature BY, and feature BX depends on feature AY. And 
This is not a problem in the Rust world. There is no loops here. So, uh, well, uh, everything will work out uh, dandy. And uh, if we were to translate this into Debian packages uh, naively, it would look something like this. So each crate would be a Debian package that have a dependency on the other package. This wouldn't work. So we resolve this by something called uh, uh, meta packages in Debian. So we create, create uh, well, one package for each crate as before, but we additionally create meta packages for all features in the crates. So we have, uh, well, a crate B or a package B that depend on the package for A plus feature AY. So the package is named uh, A plus AY. And similar for the other crate. And here we see we don't have any loops and uh, um, the loop situation is resolved. This is of course, well, this is a, a solution, but it wasn't a solution without its problems. So some Rust packages have a lot of feature. So for example, the WebSys package, uh, which is a package that exposes every well, feature in a browser as its own feature. It has 1,525 features, and the rest of Debian got angry at us, basically, for producing a lot of spam in the package registry when we uploaded these 1,526 packages to them. And we, of course, had a solution to this also. So if we imagine the whole package, uh, well, Debian package uh, uh, system as a graph, then there is a lot of leaf nodes with uh, libraries that don't depend on any other libraries. Those libraries can, of course, never be, uh, enter into one of these uh, loops. So we don't have to turn off the meta package generation feature for those packages. And the other, then there is a lot of uh, packages in the middle of the graph, and we only have to uh, turn on this uh, feature for some of those packages. Like if we know that there is a loop situation, then we can resolve this manually. And for everything else, we don't have to, uh, well, uh, turn on this meta package generation thing that generates what, what the rest of Debian thought of as spam. Another mismatch is that Rust uh, enables developers to have multiple versions of the same library compiled in the same binary. And Debian tried to not have multiple versions packaged due to maintenance work. If there is a security problem, then you have to patch a lot of stuff if you package a lot of versions. Uh, so the solution that we do is basically that we patch a lot of uh, dependency uh, files to so that we refer to the versions that are in Debian. Or if that's not possible, we try to upgrade the version in Debian and uh, patch everything else that depends on uh, that package. This is, of course, a bit like it's a bit of risky business to package uh, stuff in ways that is not trusted by upstream. And to reduce that risk, we also try to 
upstream all these uh, patches so that upstream can have an opinion about those at least. And some Rust packages or libraries are uh, very well used across uh, the whole ecosystem and those are tricky to do single phase uh, uh, upgrades for and there, so there is some duplication. For example, we have both CLAP version 3 and CLAP version 4 packaged. And another well, uh, thing that uh, might be a problem in Debian is that Debian is not super good at handling security work for uh, uh, ecosystems where there is a lot of static linking. Uh, and Rust and Go for that, uh, well, on that note, is statically linked. So, I'm not, to be honest, 100% sure on exactly what is missing, but there is some uh, tooling that the security team in Debian uses that doesn't handle statically linked uh, stuff perfectly. And my final problem that I would like to highlight is the promise that Debian make to only package source code. So this means that we don't want anything in Debian that is auto-generated. Rather, we would like to package the original source code that auto-generation happened from. But crates.io is well, it's a package registry, and sometimes people upload generated code to crates.io. So this breaks the Debian rule about only packaging source code. We can, and this can be quite a tricky problem, I would say. To take, um, well, to make this more concrete, we can look at the GNOME uh, system. So GNOME uses what is called GR, GIR files that describes the API definitions of C libraries. And GNOME uh, generates source code uh, based on those uh, definition files. And it uses a tool core uh, uh, that is also called GIR, I think, to generate that. That tool is not released in a stable version, but rather uh, used only during dependency and then, or only during development, and then the result, uh, Rust code that is the result of that tool is. Uh, manually inspected and sometimes a bit tweaked, as I've understood it. So, uh, well, it's hard to respect this rule and still package uh, GNOME software, is the conclusion. And this is not fully solved in Debian yet. Uh, Alright, so... Uh, as a final note, I would say if you want to talk to us, we are pretty active on uh, OFTC in the Debian Rust channel or uh, on the mailing list for the Rust packagers. And with that, I would conclude and move to questions. So at least one hand and a big smile. Two hands. Let's start there. Yes, I wonder if you don't.
hard to see the same problems with Rust that you see with in, in Debian with, for example, Python and, and Emacs modules. In, in the sense that you have all these nice Debian packages, but in the end you still end up using your own virtual environment or have Emacs download things from Elpa directly. Because so you, ne you never get the, 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 the version that, that you need in the end for your daily work. Right, so if I understood the question, was that how do we ensure that what we package actually works? Yeah, or how your packaging is actually competing with people just installing the crates by, by manually by hand after all. Alright, I think I, the I think the answer is that uh, Rust packages for libraries in Debian is primarily built or used to build the binaries uh, that is packaged in Debian. It's of course possible to use uh, Debian packages of Rust libraries to do your Rust development. And uh, well, if you're operating in a like, uh, legislative environment where you need to have 100% guaranteed control of your S bomb, that might be interesting. But I think you will have a bad time if you try to do this. So I think currently we have around, I don't know, 1,500 Rust libraries package out of 100,000 of trace.io. So there's a lot of stuff not packaged. So yeah, I think that answers. Otherwise, let's talk afterwards. Uh, hello. Thanks for the great presentation, uh, explained a lot of things. <laughs> I, I was always interested in the details. Um, I have three things actually. <laughs> One is a, first a hint. Um, so you mentioned about uh, that create, uh, Cargo doesn't support platform specific dependencies. Uh, you're right in the sense that uh, a lot of people don't make use of it, but it's very much possible. Um, and actually uh, I myself recently realized that uh, when I was looking at someone else's uh, cargo file and then I fixed it in my own code because I was depending on Nix uh, and um, uh, Win, Win API dependencies on all platforms in Zbus and then I changed it so it's, it's possible. So just, just as a uh, hint so that if you see that in a package that you are packaging you can contact the upstream and uh, try to persuade them to fix it. Um, and the other thing was, uh, as a question more like, um, about Rust versions, so um, I have had a lot of problems uh, in the past 20 years or so when I'm trying to get people to use Zbus and then they're saying, oh, your uh, requirement for Rust uh, uh, tooling is a bit too, too recent for Debian, for example, uh, especially some people, for some reason, they want to stick to Debian, the Rust version in Debian stable, um, and that's like a bit, bit harsh. Um, I was just wondering if there's talk in Debian of like trying to ship uh, more recent versions and get them updated more often. Yeah, so the Rust team is somewhat small. I think we are roughly six persons. And packaging the Rust compiler is, well, sort of complex. Uh, so most of the heavy lifting has been done by two persons and um, that naturally means that uh, Debian lags behind a bit. And since the Rust compiler is released every six weeks, it means every six weeks you have like, uh, well, two or three working days of work ahead of you. So it's mostly a manpower thing. And in addition to that, we are currently in a freeze period for the release. And during the freeze period, nothing gets updated that is not fixing a bug. So now we are a lot behind. Yeah. No, I, just to clarify, I wasn't expecting uh, Debian to ship every release, especially not in stable. But I was more. My question was more related to like Debian stable um, and getting recent enough. Like let's say last one year old, <laughs> the Rust into it or, or something like that. Is there any chance of that happening? No. <laughs> so Debian stable is stable and will 
continue on the versions that are well packaged. How about testing? <laughs> yeah, or yes, so testing, testing is tracking the latest Rust release typically, or with some lag, of course. Oh, that makes sense <laughs> and it brings some hopes. Um, the last thing was about, um, so you talked a bit about different, uh, you try to keep only one version of libraries of the crates, but um, I, I'm wondering how is it exactly working? Is it like, um, are you talking about multiple versions uh, under the same SAMBAR, under the same ma major version, or um, is it like uh, different uh, major versions too? So, I, spend a, I have spent a lot of time sending patches upstream in bumping dependencies to the next major release or major sandbar versions. So we, and it's quite common in Rust to, even if it's a major sandbar release, that the actual changes is, is uh, well, rough, uh, relatively small. So, for example, clap, uh, clap three to four is a summer breaking release, but well, it's still mostly the same software, and it's reasonably easy to patch projects to migrate to, from three to four. So then uh, you spend some time writing a patch for well some package, upstreaming it, and applying it to Debian at the same time. Okay, thank you. Do we have more questions? I have, but... Uh, it's, it's already been asked. asked. It was all being asked right now. Well, I can add, add uh, how long is the microphone before you after... You need the microphones for the recording. <laughs> how long is the lead time for you after a, a Rust release? Yeah, so a lot of this work has been done by a great guy called Fabian Kirinovich, or yeah, something like that, uh, that works at, uh, oh, what's it called? It's a Debian derivative for uh, virtual machines called Proxmox. So, and they, Proxmox is migrating to using a lot of Rust code internally, so they are interested in having the latest releases. So, I think about two to three months at worst, and uh, well, faster when it was faster. Uh, and the problem here is mainly that Debian supports more architectures than the Rust compiler team supports natively. So we run into some compiler problems on like ARML or similar. And in addition, those like 32-bit ARM processes are slow, so the build takes forever. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a hassle to work with, basically. But uh, it is what it is. Okay, thank you. So, there is another hand. Um, packaging so many libraries, which I presume they all have their own license, uh, which FTP master has to review one by one. Um, since the time to go in can already be of months before something is reviewed, uh, doesn't this risk uh, overloading an uh, already overloaded uh, situation? <laughs> and uh, is there any plan to, I don't know, streamline it or do something about it? Yeah, like we have roughly talked about could we automate this even more? Like a Rust library comes out and we like package it and up uploads it to the FTP masters. But that would, I would think, create uh, havoc in the Debian system if we sent a hundred thousand packages to the FTP masters. So, 
We have been collaborating with uh, one guy called Torsten in the FTP Masters team and he has done tremendous work at actually reviewing uh, our Rust packages in a timely manner. So we are super grateful um, to him. Or I am at least. Uh, regarding your question, uh, it's really out of my area of expertise, uh, so I will not answer it. And maybe you can talk to someone more, uh, well, skilled in that area afterwards. Or and now I don't see any more hands, so I guess we'll go for coffee. Big thanks to you, Alexander. Thank you.